It's time for math class already? some math. Calculus, early transcendentals, I can't wait to learn about E. Calculus, you make me go into logarithms aren't easy for me. When limits got you down and your mind won't work at all, don't worry about it, baby. Here comes Lopetaha. Calculus, early transcendentals, Hyperbolic coast to catenary Calculus Learn real world models When you make it to calculus Hello once again The topics for today are Infinite limits and limits at infinity The idea of today's lesson Is that we're going to explore What happens with a function When you let the variable, let's say x Become very large and go to infinity or possibly it becomes very large and negative and goes to negative infinity. What happens to the function values? How do we describe that sort of situation? Another thing that can happen is that x is approaching some ordinary value, like maybe 5, but then the function itself is blowing up and going to infinity. How do we describe that? Where do you see those sort of situations happen a lot? For example, consider f of x equals 1 over x. What happens if we let x become very large in that function? How do we describe that? Also, in f of x equals 1 over x, what happens if x gets really close to 0? How do we describe what's going on there? Today we'll develop the techniques and the notation for dealing with those kinds of situations. Hello. Today's topic is infinite limits and limits at infinity. It's actually two topics. They kind of sound the same, but they're different, of course. Um, we'll start with infinite limits. So this is how we describe it when a function sort of blows up and the numbers start getting really large in the function without any sort of bound. So we have these three bits of notation here. Number one, here we say the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to infinity. And the second one, is, and the, the second one and the third one are just the one-sided versions of that same idea. So the second one's saying the limit of f of x as x approaches a on the right is infinity. And then the third one is talking about the left-hand limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is infinity. Each of these indicate that as x approaches a, either from both sides or the right or the left, the value of f of x is just increasing without bound. Let's draw a few pictures to illustrate what we mean by these three different notations. The two-sided version of this on the left there, the limit as x approaches a, two-sided, of f of x equals infinity, this just means that as the input values of the function start getting close to a, the function values are getting really big. In the middle picture there, we're talking about the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x is infinity. So here we're only talking about that one-sided phenomenon where if it does something like this. And then on the, the rightmost graph there, we're talking about the left-hand limit of f of x as x approaches a is infinity. So there we might be having something going on like that. If the function f can go upward without bound at some point a, it can certainly go downward as well, right? And so the next bit of notation that we have are to describe that sort of phenomenon. So number four there is the two-sided version. It says the, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is negative infinity. So here it just means that the function is decreasing without bound as x gets close to a. And then we have the two one-sided versions of this. So when you see the positive infinity as the solution for a limit, 
the positive infinity means it's going the function the graph's going upward without any bound and the negative infinity means it's going downward so we might see this sort of behavior here stuff like this could happen so there's the two-sided version or we could have the limit coming in from the right go to negative infinity so something like this could happen and then left-handed version something like that could happen so let's look at a specific example so at this point I'm not trying to get into the specifics of how we calculate these things algebraically. I just want to look at a few, like look at a graph, look at a table, and see specific instances where we have limits at infinity. I'm sorry, infinite limits. So, limit as x approaches 2 of 1 over x minus 2. What's going on there? Well, let's have a look at the graph. But before we do that, observe that if you try to plug in 2, in for x, you're going to get zero in the denominator, and that's probably that's going to cause some sort of issue, right? So there's the graph. Now I can see as we move along the left hand side of two, the function's going downward. So it looks like my left hand limit is going to be negative infinity, and similarly, I can see as I move. As, I, as my x's approach 2 from the right-hand side, those y values are going to upward. So we're going to get a right-hand limit of positive infinity there. From the graph, it appears the limit as x approaches 2 on the left-hand side is equal to negative infinity, and the limit as x approaches 2 on the right-hand side appears to be positive infinity, and the two-sided limit in this particular case, just the limit as x approaches 2, of 1 over x minus 2. Since it's not doing the same thing on the left and the right, I would just say it does not exist, just like before when we were dealing with regular finite limits. On the other hand, we might examine this variation of the previous function, 1 over x minus 2 quantity squared. Let's go look at what the graph is saying about that. To, to get your mind going the right way, you might think about what that squaring on the bottom is doing what effect it has. Okay, So slightly different this time. I'm seeing that the graph is going upward on both sides of 2 there. On the basis of the graph here, it looks like analyzing the, the one-sided limits, the limit as x approaches 2 on the left, looks like it is going to be positive infinity, and the limit on the right hand side is positive infinity and so then also the two-sided limit is positive infinity at least that's what the graph seems to indicate mainly right now I'm just trying to convey the idea of what does it mean when you say the limit as x approaches some fixed value equals infinity or negative infinity we're going to get into how to compute that shortly right now in fact yeah, just like before, once we have the idea of what these limits mean, we want to be able to do algebra. So whenever we say we want to compute these things analytically, when we use that word, it just means that we want to use algebraic and sort of number reasoning as opposed to just relying on tables or graphs. But actually it turns out that dealing with limits, infinite limits, isn't super duper hard if you just use a little bit of number sense. It basically comes down to these four observations that I've got bulleted here. The first one is, if you take a positive number, just pick your favorite positive number, it doesn't really matter what, just as long as it's not zero or negative. Like, maybe your favorite positive number is two. So take your favorite positive number, and then take it and divide by something that is very close to zero and positive. What are you going to get? Like down here at the bottom here, I'm just going to do some sort of a, a computation along those lines. So if I do 2 and I divide by something that is very close to 0 but positive, so something like 0, 0, 1 or something like that, what happens? Well, you get a gi ginormous number, right? 200,000 in this case. So the idea is if the number that you're dividing by is getting very, very close to 0 and the number in the top is a fixed constant or very close to a fixed constant, like doesn't range very much, then the idea is that that whole fraction is going to going to infinity. 
And similarly, the second bulleted point there, if you take a positive number and then you divide by a negative number that's really very close to zero, so, for example, if I would take at the bottom of the screen there, if I would take something like 2 and divide by negative 0.001, well, then I got negative 20,000, which is a big number, but negative. The idea is that when, when in this sort of situation, the result's going to negative infinity. So think about the denominators getting very, very close to 0. What's the whole fraction going to? Negative infinity. You can play the same game with the third bullets and the fourth bullets. Like if, th if the number in the top is negative, but you're dividing by a positive number, the result's going to be a large negative number. And on the last one, you're taking a negative number in the top, and you're dividing by a small negative number, but negative divided by negative is positive, so you end up with something that's getting large positive, so going to positive infinity. I can kind of give you a little shorthand for sort of abbreviating these behaviors. So maybe... If I let C represent my positive constant, C with a plus on top, so positive constant, divided by something that's getting close to zero and positive, so I'm putting zero plus to indicate, not exactly zero, but something that's close to zero but positive, then that's going to go to infinity. And on the second one, you would have C plus over zero minus. That's going to negative infinity. And then we have a C minus over 0 plus. That's going to negative infinity. And we have C minus over 0 minus is going to positive infinity. So with these sort of numerical principles in mind, let's try them out on a few examples. So... In the first, so I've got four examples that you'll see we can knock them out all pretty quickly just by analyzing what is the numerator doing and what is the de denominator doing. In each of these examples, the denominator is getting close to zero, and then the numerator is getting close to some other constant that's not zero. And so we just have to think about the signs of things. Is the numerator positive? Is you know, you got to think about the signs. So in the first one, you look at five x minus four. And x is going to 2 on the right, but x is going to 2. So as x gets close to 2, that's going to get close to 5 times 2, 10 minus 4. So that's getting close to 6. Now what's the bottom getting close to as x goes to 2 from the right? Well, because x is going to 2 on the right-hand side, that means the values of x that you're putting in are a little bit bigger than 2. So x is greater than 2 in this situation. So if x is greater than 2, x minus 2 is going to be positive. But x is going to 2, so the denominator is getting close to 0, but it's staying positive the whole time. So the bottom is doing going to 0, but in the positive way. So the result is that because the numerator is positive and the bottom is going to zero and it's positive, we're getting positive infinity here. So you just have to think about the numerator and the denominator separately for a second. It doesn't take very long. Um, we can look at the left-hand version of this very same limit. So here in the example on the right of the last one we did, x is going to 2 on the left. And that means your x's are less than 2. So your numerator is going to 6. 5 times 2 minus 4 is 6 again. But the denominator, well, the denominator is still going to 0. But because the values of x that you're putting in are a little bit less than 2, think like 1.9 or something like that, the denominator is going to be negative for those values of x under consideration. And so now we're taking 6 and we're dividing it by something that's getting close to 0 and negative. So it looks like we're going to get negative infinity on this one. Let's do the one on the lower left. OK, x is going to 1. Now this is a two-sided limit. 
Now, if I can't figure out what's going on with the, the two-sided situation, I can always think about the left and the right separately and see if they match or not. Um, let's see. In the numerator, x is going to negative 1. So negative 1 cubed is negative 1. So we've got a negative constant is what's happening on the top. And then on the bottom, okay, x is going to negative 1. I'm going to change the problem slightly to make it more interesting. Let's change that to x plus 1. There we go. But x is going to negative 1. So you get negative 1 plus 1 is 0 squared in the bottom. But, so it's getting close to 0. But since you're squaring it, when you square a number, it always comes out non-negative, right? So this is going to 0, but in the positive fashion in the denominator. So in total there, um, you've got a, it's coming out to a negative constant in the top. I'm sorry, negative constant in the top and getting close to 0 positive in the bottom. So this is coming out to negative infinity. And it doesn't matter. Um, it's a two-sided limit, so both the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are going to give you negative infinity on this one. Okay, one more, the one on the lower right. There your x is going to negative 1 again. And just, just like before on the left, the numerator is going to negative 1. Um, what's happening with the denominator? Well, there, I think we need to be a bit more careful and think about one-sided things. Because I'm thinking about, you know, if I would put in something like negative 0 0.9, well, now I was thinking about a right-hand limit, um, I think I'd be getting a negative output in the bottom. But if I would put in something to the left of negative 1, like negative 1.1, then I'm going to get something that's positive. So on this one... Let's be a little bit careful. If we do the limit as x approaches negative 1 on the right-hand side, we got the numerator going to negative 1, and the denominator is going to be going to 0. But, you know, think about on the number line. If here's negative 1, something that's to the right of negative 1 might be something like negative 0 0.9. And if you would put in negative 0 0.9 and square it and then subtract 1, you're going to get a negative value there. So at this point, I'm getting sort of a negative in top and negative in the bottom. So, But the bottom's going to 0. So this is coming out to positive infinity. And if I do look at the limit as x approaches 1, negative 1 on the left-hand side, now I'd be thinking about plugging in numbers like negative 1.1. And when I take something like negative 1.1 and I square it and then I subtract 1, I see that the bottom, the denominator, is going to 0 in the positive way. And then again, the numerator is going to negative 1. So on the right-hand limit, I'm getting negative infinity. And then because the right and the left-hand limits don't match, that tells me that the original limit that I was trying to consider does not exist. I guess on these, these limits where you have to decide if it's going to be positive infinity or negative infinity because the denominator is going to zero, and you, it comes down to sort of a numerical analysis of what's going on. It's not so much algebra. It's more about um, thinking about signs of things. This can come up in the guise of trigonometric functions, too. For example, if I want to know what's happening with the tangent function at pi over 2, now I could run and look at a graph, but I want to resist the urge of, of doing that right now. I know that the tangent function is sine of x over cosine of x, right? And from my knowledge of trigonometry, I know that at pi over 2, cosine is going to 0. Cosine goes to 0. 
but is it plus or minus? Or maybe depends on which side you're on. A sine, when you plug in pi over 2, you get 1. So I'm in this situation where as you're taking the limit, the numerator's converging on a non-zero constant, a positive non-zero constant, and the denominator's going to zero, and i got to try to think about, well, is it doing it in a negative way or a positive way? And when in doubt, look at the one-sided limits. So if I think about the unit circle, pi over 2 is that angle 90 degrees straight up, and and then I'm going to draw the angle x here. So x will be like, well, if x is a little bit less than pi over 2, it would look something like that. So here's the angle x. Now remember, on the unit circle, the cosine of x is the x-coordinate of that point where it crosses the, the terminal side of the angle crosses the unit circle. Now I can see just by looking at this graph that the x-coordinate is to the right of the y-axis, so the cosine is going to be positive. So in this situation, cosine of x is greater than 0. I can look at the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the left of sine of x over cosine of x. And in that situation, numerator's going to 1 still. Denominator's going to 0, but on from the right. I'm getting positive values of cosine. So it's positive over positive, so I'm going to get positive infinity here. On the other hand, if I draw the angle x so that x is a little bit bigger than pi over 2, so something like this, the cosine being the x-coordinate of that point where the angle crosses the circle, the x-coordinates are negative over there in the second quadrant, so my cosine of x is going to be less than 0 here for these angles. So that tells me that when I look at the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right, I know it looks like in the picture the angle is approaching from the left, but you got to think about where x, x is on the number line. In the, in the bottom picture there on the circle, even though the angle is on the left of pi over 2, the value of x is greater than pi over 2. So if you drew those numbers on a number line, x would be on the right. So anyway, in this situation, the numerator is going to, to 1 again. And the denominator is going to 0, but from the negative way. So that means that this limit is going to come out to negative infinity. And when you put these two facts together right here, they don't match. So this tells me that the limit as x approaches pi over 2 the two-sided limit of the tangent function, which is sine over cosine, just does not exist. Let's quickly just go take a quick look at the graph of the tangent function on Desmos around pi over 2. Pi over 2 is like what? 1.7? So you're having a, a 1.7 as you're going up this branch right here. It takes it a while to get there, but um, you can see that it's this asymptote right here between 1 and 2 on the x-axis, and it's going to positive infinity on the left-hand side, and it's going to negative infinity on the right-hand side of that asymptote. Um, and I think that's what we found analytically, right? The left-hand limit was positive infinity, just like we saw in the picture there, and the right-hand limit was negative infinity. So it matches with what the graph is saying, unsurprisingly. Okay, well here's another one of these sort of trigonometric limits. Um, this one's a little easier to analyze than the first one. As x, or as theta this time, use theta to make it seem really scary. Um, as theta goes to zero, 
Well, what is sine of zero? Sine of zero is zero. So this is going to two plus zero, which is two. So the numerator is just going to this fixed constant two. Now what's happening in the denominator is that, well, it's going to one minus cosine of zero, cosine squared of zero. Well, cosine of zero is one. So when you do one squared, you still get one. So it's getting close to zero, but is it doing it positive or negative? Well, if you think about it, um, cosine of theta in absolute value, like it never gets bigger than one. In other words, cosine is always between negative one and positive one, right? So that tells me that cosine squared of theta is always less than or equal to one. So if cosine squared of theta is always less than or equal to one, one minus cosine squared of theta has to be less than, has to be bigger than or equal to zero. Because you're taking one and you're subtracting something that's smaller than one. So you get something positive. So this is always a positive value here in the denominator. Even though it's getting close to zero, it always stays positive as long as you don't put in zero exactly. And so you can see pretty quickly on this one that the answer is positive infinity because it's getting close to positive two in the top and get going to zero but positive in the bottom. Okay. So anyway, you can kind of see how that kind of reasoning works. It's a little harder for trig functions than it is for you know regular old powers of x, but you can still do it. So we've been using the word, I've used the word vertical asymptote a few times, but here we give it a formal definition. A vertical asymptote is a line of the form x equals a. Whenever you graph a line with that equation, x equals a, it's a, it's a vertical line through the x value of a. And the way you can tell that you have a vertical asymptote of x equals a is if one of these limits where x is going to a, or x is going to a on the right, or if x is going to a on the left, if any of those limits equals plus or minus infinity, you've got yourself a vertical asymptote. If I were to ask you, hey, find all the vertical asymptotes of this function, um, you want to look for places where the function is going to blow up and go to infinity. Because that's what the definition of a vertical asymptote is, right? It's a place where the limit of the function is either plus or minus infinity. And we know from experience that what causes a function to blow up and go to infinity is when you divide by zero. So first step is to figure out what causes you to have a zero in the denominator. Now maybe something weird is happening in the numerator too that could cause an asymptote because I got a weird function up there. But cosine, it doesn't do anything weird that's going to make you go to infinity in the numerator. Cosine just bounces between negative one and positive one. So it doesn't ever do anything that causes the function to explode. But the denominator on the other hand, x squared plus 2x, we could factor that to help us see where it's going to be equal to 0. And if you factor out an x, you can write it as x times the quantity x plus 2. Now I can tell at a glance that x equals 0 and x equals negative 2 are going to cause zeros in the denominator, right? So that tells me I probably got some asymptotes there. Maybe not. Sometimes just because you have a zero in the denominator, it could be canceling with something that's going on in the numerator. But those are your candidates. So we want to look at what's going on at x equals zero and x equals negative two. Let's start with let's start with the limit as x approaches zero of cosine of x over x times x plus 2. Well, if I put in 0 into the numerator, for into the cosine function, cosine of 0, I know, is equal to 1. So this is getting close to 1. In fact, that was one of our basic trig limits that we looked at in, in our uh, in previous lesson. Now, in the denominator, um, this term would be going to zero, and 
the remaining term there would just be getting close to 2. So the whole denominator is going to 0. Um, but you can see if x would go to 0 on the left so that your x's were negative, um, you would get it going to 0 negative in the bottom, and so you'd get the whole bottom would be negative. But on the other hand, if, if you looked at x is going to 0 on the right, you'd get the reverse of that. Um, you'd get a positive denominator. So this is telling me, after thinking about whether or not x is positive or negative, I should do two-sided limits. So if I use two-sided limits, I'll do the limit as x goes to 0 on the left. And thinking about it just like I did a minute ago, I can see that the bottom's going to 0, but it's going to be negative, and the top's going to 1, so that's positive. So this is going to be negative infinity. And the limit on the right-hand side of 0 is going to be positive infinity because the bottom's going to 0, but it's doing so in a positive way, and the top is also positive. So... I know there's an asymptote. I only needed one of those one-sided limits to be infinite, either plus or minus infinity. But it turned out both of them were infinite. It's just that the function, when you look at the graph of it, on the left of 0, it's going to be going downward. And when you look on the right of 0, it's going to be going upward. So we have a little a nuanced understanding of that asymptote now. And also, so this tells us that x equals 0 is an asymptote. A vertical asymptote. Okay, now let's look at the limit as x approaches negative 2. Well, x equals negative 2 is a strange number to have to plug into cosine, and off the top of my head, I don't know very closely what it would be. I think it'll be negative though, but I can use a little, I'm going to cheat and use the calculator here for a second. Okay, Desmos, what is cosine of negative 2? Okay, it comes out to like negative 0.41. So, I don't need to know exactly what it is. I just need to know that it's negative. So this goes to like negative 0 0.4, okay? And then in the bottom, it's we've got our x is going to negative 2, so I got a negative 2 there. And then the x plus 2 is going to 0. But is it going to 0 positive or negative? Well, it's pretty easy to analyze. If you put in numbers a little less than you know, to the left of negative 2, something like negative 2.1, you're going to get that that x plus 2 is negative. But on the other hand, if you plug in something to the right of negative 2, like 1.9, you're going to get a positive value there. So it, you're going to get two different one-sided limits. So let me write down that analysis. So here I'm going to have limit as x goes to negative 2, cosine x over x times x plus 2. Okay, the on the left, so x goes to negative 2 on the left, I'm going to get negative infinity. And when I do the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right, oh wait, i got to be careful. Oops, I think I made a mistake. Just because I wasn't being careful. Let me go back and analyze my thinking a little bit more carefully here. Um, okay, so if I'm trying to do the left-hand limit, I know that the top is going to negative 0 0.4. This x is going to negative 2. And then this is going to 0, but it's going to be negative. So look in the denominator there. I've got negative 2 times a negative number that's getting close to zero. So it's going to be negative times negative in the denominator, so that's positive, and then the numerator's negative, so you should get negative infinity.
I guess that's what I had originally, but I think it was by luck. And then when we do the right hand limit, we do a similar sort of thinking. We know the top is getting close to negative 0 0.4. That term is getting close to negative 2. And that term is getting close to 0. But if I put in something on the right of, of negative 2, like negative 1.9, I get a positive value. So in the denominator, I'm, I'm multiplying negative 2 times something that's positive close to 0. So the denominator is negative, and the numerator is negative. So altogether, you got something positive. So it's going to positive infinity. Of course, we usually don't put a plus in front of the infinity. Although if you did, it wouldn't be so bad. So our left-hand limits, and our left-hand limit and our right-hand limit, they were both infinite just with different signs. But either one of them being infinite is enough to tell you that you got an asymptote. So we know we got x equals negative 2 is an asymptote. I think I misspelled asymptote a minute ago. Oh my goodness. I made a real asymptote of myself. So our next topic Instead of talking about limits that are infinite, we're going to be looking at limits ad infinity. So the difference here is that instead of thinking instead of thinking about the x is going to some fixed value and then the function blows up to infinity, we're letting the, the variable x go to infinity. And we're seeing what effect that has on the function values. So if it's possible that as you, you know, well, let's talk about what this notation means. When we, when we use this notation right here, the limit of f of x as x goes to infinity equals l, what we're saying is that those function values, f of x, can be made as close to l as we like if we just choose our x's to be large enough. Large and positive, because x is going to the positive infinity there. And similarly, we can you know have a x going to negative infinity, and we can wonder, as x is getting large and negative, are the function values getting close to some fixed value l? So how would that manifest itself, these two ideas of limit, graphically? So the first one is x is getting large, and the second one, x is getting large and negative. So it just means that if the function values, those are the y values, right, are getting close to l, it's, you know, it looks something like this. So this would be what it would kind of look like if x was going to, if the limit as x goes to infinity of f, f of x were l, it'd be like on that left picture there. The y values are getting close to some fixed value l. And similarly, if x is going to negative infinity and the limit comes out to l, it would look like what you see on the right picture there. You can see why then we call those horizontal asymptotes, those lines y equals l. In both of these pictures, the line y equals l is a horizontal asymptote of the function. So it's just a line that the graph of the function gets close to as you move way out to the left or way out to the right on the function. So just, just to give you a very specific thing, without telling you how to compute it, let me just you know use the computer, use the graph to illustrate it. So here I've got this function 3 plus 8 over x squared. I wonder what's going on as x gets large. Well, let's just look at the graph. Okay, there's the graph. Okay, now I do happen to see there's a vertical asymptote here, but that's not what I'm interested in right at this moment. I'm interested in what's happening as you're putting in big positive x values and big negative x values. Well, it looks like as I put in bigger and bigger values of x, I'm just scooching way out here to the right, it looks like those y values are getting close to 3. And then as you move way out to the left and start looking at really big negative x values, I'm getting the same thing. It looks like 3 is what it's getting close to. So that's the idea of limits at infinity. It's like what's happening 
on the ends, on the right extreme right-hand end and what's happening on the extreme left-hand end. For this reason, it's sometimes said that we're looking at end behavior when we look at limits at infinity, like Sx goes to infinity or negative infinity. Okay, yeah, so looking at this graph, sure does look like the limit as x goes to positive infinity of 3 plus 8 over x squared, it sure looks like it's getting close to 3, because that was the y value of 3 there on that graph. And similarly, it also looks like the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 3 plus 8 over x squared is 3. So hopefully you have a good sense of graphically what it means to talk about a limit at infinity just means what's it doing on the f extreme far right side of the graph and what's it doing on the extreme left side of the graph. And then to mix the two concepts that we've spoken about, we've spoken about infinite limits and we've spoken about limits at infinity. So you can have both of those things happening at the same time. You can have an infinite limit that happens at infinity. In other words, as x goes to infinity, the function can go to infinity. In fact, that's pretty normal. So there's four different varieties of these things that can happen. If you have the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals infinity, that means that as you move to the far right-hand side of the graph of f, the value, you know, the, the function's growing without bound. And then on the second one, the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x equals infinity means that as you move out to the left side of the graph, the function's going way up. And then the third one, the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals negative infinity means that as you move to the far right side of the graph, the function's going way down. And then lastly, the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x equals negative infinity means that as you move out to the far left-hand side of the graph, the graph is going down. So on the left graph here, you can see by looking at the far left-hand side of the graph, so this is telling you that the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x equals negative infinity. And over here, as you move to the far right side of the graph, it's telling you that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is infinity. And on the second picture, the one on the right, when you look at the left-hand side of the graph there, it's telling you that the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x equals positive infinity. And then on the right-hand side of that graph, you see that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is negative infinity. So these are all the behaviors that you can kind of see on the ends there. So for a specific example, what's going on with x cubed? Well, x cubed is one of those sort of stock functions. I don't even need Desmos to help me graph that one. I can whip out a pretty convincing picture of it pretty fast. It looks kind of like this. So just considering the graph of it, it looks like what's going on here is that the limit as x goes to infinity of x cubed equals infinity. And then the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x cubed equals negative infinity. And that's not surprising at all. If So the first limit there is just saying, hey, if you take a really big number and you cube it, you're going to get back an even really bigger number. And if you take a really big negative number and you cube it, you're gonna get back a really even bigger negative number.
we were just looking at graphs and we need to come up with some sort of algebraic analytic ways to get the answers. And so it'll come back down to this sort of idea of finding the atoms. What are the basic little pieces that we put together to form more complicated functions? And if we can understand those little pieces, then we'll be able to understand the more complicated functions. And the most basic little piece that you can come up with are powers of x, things like x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on. So it turns out that if you take the limit as x goes to either plus or minus infinity of x to the n, you're going to get infinity whenever you're talking about an even integer n. So if you take something like x squared or x to the fourth and you start putting in big numbers, it doesn't matter whether they're positive or negative. When you take a, a number and you raise it to an even power, you always make it positive, right? So you're always going to get positive infinity in those cases. And then when you have odd integers, well, you, it does make a difference whether your x's are positive or negative. So the limit as x goes to positive infinity of x to the n is going to be positive infinity, and the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x to the n is going to be negative infinity when you're dealing with an odd integer. So think about x cubed, for example. The example we just did. When you put a really big positive number into x cubed, you get a big positive number back. And when you put a big negative number into x cubed, you get a big negative number back. And then we want to look at reciprocals of x to the n. When you take 1 divided by x to the n and you put in a really big number, it doesn't really matter whether it's a really big positive number or a really big negative number. When you raise it to a big power, and when you raise it to a power, you're going to get an even bigger number. It could be positive or it could be negative. But if you take 1 over a gigantic number, positive or negative, it comes out close to 0. Like, think about 1 divided by negative 1 million. That's just going to be pretty close to 0. So that's our last little atomic nugget of limits that we'll use to analyze a great many more complicated functions. And the cool thing is, these basic little facts, I think, are pretty intuitively clear. They could be proven in, like, with very mathematical, very rigorous mathematical means, but we're not going to get into that in this class. But just real quick, let's see if we can answer a few, like, really basic atomic level type questions here. Like, what's the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the fourth, this first one, in my example? Well, take a big number, raise it to the fourth power, it's going to be an even bigger power, even bigger number. And it's going to be positive, so positive infinity. The second one, take a really big negative number, cube it. That's going to be an even really bigger negative number. Multiply it times 2, that's still a big negative number, so you get negative infinity here on the second one. And the last one is saying, take a really big positive number, um, put it into x to the fifth, and you get this gigantic number, and then divide that into 3. Well, you're taking 3 and dividing by a gigantic positive number, you're going to get something very close to 0. So the limit there is 0. So these little atomic nuggets here are pretty easy to analyze. But to give you our first example of how we can use this to analyze more complicated functions, let's start with polynomials. Well, a polynomial function can be written in this very general form here. I know it looks a little scary, but you know, these are just things like We've talked about polynomials previously, but all those a's with the subscripts on them are um, constants. And so, you know, something like p of x equals 3x to the fourth minus 4x squared 
plus 2x minus 5. That would be an example of a polynomial, a fourth degree polynomial. So whatever the biggest power is on the polynomial, you, you call that the degree of the polynomial. Now, if we take our really general polynomial there, that p of x that I highlighted in blue, and we factor out x to the n, we end up with this expression. It's the same thing, it's just I pulled out x to the n. And when you pull out an x to the n on the terms that have a, a lesser degree than n, you end up getting some fractions. Now you can check that this factorization is correct just by multiplying the x to the n back in, and you'll see. You get a sub n times x to the n, and then when you multiply times that second term, one of the x's will, will cancel, and you'll have n minus 1 x's. So the power is at n minus 1, and so on. But the cool thing about this is, is that check it out. As x goes to infinity, what happens to some... I'm interested in, um, by the way, what is the limit? As x goes to infinity of this polynomial. I'll also be wa wanting to know what's the limit as x goes to negative infinity. Well, the thing that I circled in red there, as x gets big, now it doesn't really matter whether x gets big positive or x gets big negative. When you take a constant a sub n, you know, that constant a sub n minus 1, and you divide it by a gigantic number, positive or negative, it's going to get close to 0. And the same thing is going to happen with each of these fractional terms. They're all going to go to 0 because you're taking a constant and dividing it by a gigantic number. So the limit as x goes to infinity of p of x is just going to work out to be, since all those terms circled in red go to 0, you only end up with like analyzing what is the limit of a sub n times x to the n. That's the only thing that's left after you get rid of all the things that went to 0. Same thing when x is going to negative infinity. And then we know how to analyze powers of x as x goes to plus or minus infinity. That was the, the content of what's in yellow and what's in blue there. It just depends on whether your exponent n is even or odd. And then it'll also depend on the sign of, of your a sub n. And so you're either going to get plus or minus infinity depending on n being even and even or odd and the sign of a sub n so if you take the limit of a polynomial as x goes to plus or minus infinity you're going to get either plus or minus infinity and it's only going to depend on the leading term so the only term in the polynomial that really mattered was this term the a sub n times x to the n, the leading term. And this is summarized in theorem 2.6 there. Okay, so as an example of this, let's just take this polynomial here. So what we figured out about polynomials is that all you really need to analyze is what's going on with the leading term. In, that, in this case, the leading term is negative 2x cubed. So this limit, x is going to negative infinity. I just have to worry about negative 2x cubed. Well, this is not too hard to think about. As x goes to negative infinity, we know that that x cubed term there is going to negative infinity. But those terms that are going to negative infinity there are getting multiplied times negative 2, so that makes them positive. So what you've got is some really big negative number multiplied times negative 2 makes it a big positive number. So the answer is infinity, positive infinity. And it's just that easy. So now 
this is pretty cool. I mean, I hope you appreciate this. I do. Just by understanding these little nuggets right here in yellow, blue, and green, in fact, just the first two was all we needed for the polynomials, um, we can work out any polynomial very easily. So our atoms put together to form these molecules, the polynomials, we've got it under control just because we understand the sort of atomic level limits. And I don't care how big the polynomial is. I only got to look at the first term. It's great. I like it when things are simple. Okay. Let's step it up. Let's look at rational functions and also algebraic functions. So we know what rational functions are. We've talked about those previously. Algebraic functions just means it involves radicals. Um, and there's this one really standard technique for handling these kinds of functions. The standard technique is divide the numerator and the denominator by x to the n, where n is the degree of the denominator. Um, the degree of the denominator is just the exponent of the, or the biggest exponent that you see in the denominator. So, let's try this trick. Let's see how it applies to um, this first example. So we got we got a limit as x is going to infinity. We got three x squared minus two x in the numerator and x squared plus ten in the bottom. The denominator is a second degree polynomial. So the trick there is we're going to divide both the numerator and the denominator by x squared. So in other words, multiply by one over x squared in the top and multiply by 1 over x squared in, in the denominator. And you want to distribute, okay? So when you distribute, like so, you end up with the limit as x goes to infinity. Okay, that'll end up being 3 minus 2 over x and then you'll have 1 plus 10 over x squared in the denominator. Now why is this good? Well the reason it is it's really good is because one of these little atomic level nuggets that we were talking about earlier is what do you get when you have like a 1 over x to the n, the green one here? So anytime you're taking the limit, doesn't matter whether x is going to plus or minus infinity, 1 over a power of x is going to 0. So right away, I can see that, well, 2 over x is going to go to 0 also. I mean, if 1 over x goes to 0, then multiplying that times 2, it's still going to 0. So that's going to go to 0. Same thing with 10 over x squared. I know 1 over x squared goes to 0, but if I multiply that times 10, it's still going to 0. So those terms right there are going to 0, and so quickly I arrive at just 3 over 1, or 3. That's not so bad, right? Now we can do the same trick here in the second one. I'm just going to multiply by the the largest exponent in the denominator. So I got one, I'm going to multiply by 1 over x squared times 1 over x squared. I'm going to distribute that out. I'm doing that inside the limit, right? So this is limit as x is going to infinity. And end up with 5 over x plus 6 over x squared in the numerator. In the denominator, I get 1 minus 4 over x squared. And then I can see a bunch of things are going to 0. That one's going to 0. That one's going to 0. That one's going to 0. So I've got 0 plus 0 in the numerator, which is 0. And 1 in the denominator. So 0 over 1 is still 0. 
pretty cool trick. So again, we, we're just each time reducing these problems to a bunch of little um, individual limits that are easy to evaluate because they're little, are sort of little atoms. Well, it's not always the case that the highest degree term in the denominator is a second power. Let me mix it up here. Let me go to the fifth power there. Just make it a little different. Well, if it's a fifth degree denominator, then I'll multiply times 1 over x to the fifth top and bottom. And after I distribute, I'll be looking at limit as x goes to negative infinity. One over x squared minus four over x cubed. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, x cubed plus five over x to the fourth plus seven over x to the fifth. Then in the bottom you'd get minus two minus five over x to the fourth. plus 9 over x to the fifth. And you can see all the terms in the numerator go to 0, and all the terms except for the negative 2 in the bottom go to 0. So this ends up being 0 over negative 2, or 0. For this example, we have a radical involved. and But actually, we pretty much use the same principle as we were doing with the rational functions a minute ago. So here we have an algebraic function, but the principle is the same. We're going to multiply, or, or I'm sorry, divide both the numerator and the denominator by the highest degree term in the denominator, which is x. So we multiply by 1 over x in the top and multiply by 1 over x in the bottom. What effect does that have? Well, in the denominator, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. You're just going to have... 1 when you multiply 1 over x times x. But what's going on in the numerator? Well, in order to pull the 1 over x inside that radical, you need to square it. So you'd have 16x squared plus x multiplied times 1 over x squared inside the radical if you want to pull that 1 over x inside there. Because if I would take the square root of that 1 over x squared, I would just get 1 over x. And then, now you can distribute the 1 over x squared inside the radical. And you'll have square root of 16 plus 1 over x inside the radical. And then you still just have... Well, I can just go ahead and forget about that 1, right? Dividing by 1 is just the same as multiplying by 1. So I end up with just the square root of 16 plus 1 over x. And now the 1 over x, I know it's one of my atomic level facts. That 1 over x is going to 0. And I just end up with taking the square root of 16 when I take the limit. And so it comes out to 4. Here's a slightly trickier variation of that, an algebraic function. This time the radical is in the denominator. Now the denominator isn't exactly a polynomial, so what do I mean by the degree of it? Well, the thing of, it doesn't exactly have a degree, but um, when you think about really big values of x, that square root of x to the eighth plus three, you know, the adding, after you put in x equals a billion, and then you raise it to the eighth power, that adding 3 doesn't really change the value of it that much, relatively speaking. So really, when you put in big values of x, that square root of x to the 8th is acting like x to the 4th, because you're taking the, it's essentially the square root of x to the 8th. So really, that term right there is kind of acting like x to the 4th. And so... 
if I'm trying to pick the highest degree term in the denominator to divide the numerator and the denominator by, I'm going to go with x to the fourth. So I'm going to multiply by 1 over x to the fourth in the top. And I'm going to divide by 1 over x to the fourth in the bottom. And let's see what happens here. Well, in the numerator, you distribute the 1 over x to the 4th, and you get 2 over x minus 7 over x cubed. And then in the denominator, if you're going to pull the 1 over x 4th inside that radical, it's going to become a 1 over x to the 8th. So you'd have something like x to the 8th. plus 3, and then inside the radical times 1 over x to the 8th. Then minus, you'll have 2 over x squared when you distributed the 1 over x to the 4th term to the 2x squared term there. So, but now inside that radical, I want to distribute And inside that radical, you'll just have 1 plus 3 over x to the 8th. And then you still got that minus 2 over x squared there. But now you're ready to evaluate the limit because you've got all the little atomic level fractions that you want. You got a term going to 0 there. You got a term going to 0 there. That term's going to 0. And that term's going to 0. So after you kind of replace all those terms that are going to 0 by 0, what are you left with? Well, you've got 0 in the top, and you've got square root of 1 in the bottom, which is just 1. So it just comes out to 0. So the ones with the radicals aren't that much more difficult to do than the rational functions. So hopefully those aren't too scary now that you've seen the trick a couple of times. Okay, one last little topic within this idea of limits at infinity and infinite limits. There's a couple of functions that we haven't been talking too much about so far, but those are exponential functions and logarithms. Um, this is just a little summary of the behaviors of... So, here in yellow... It's the behavior of the end behavior of the exponential function e to the x. So as x goes to infinity, e to the x goes to infinity. Below, that's the graph in red. And then, or maybe I should try to color code a little bit better. I don't really have a red highlighter, but I got a pink highlighter. So that matches up with the red down below. Um, e to the negative x. That's just the reciprocal, right? When you do e to the negative x, it's just 1 over e to the x. Um, it has just the opposite behavior as the original exponential function. So you see it in blue. And then the green function, the logarithm, the natural logarithm, you see it's in behavior. Now notice the natural log it's not even defined for negative numbers. You can only take natural log of positive numbers, but you can take the limit as x goes to 0 on the right, and you see that it goes to negative infinity. So that's sort of its end behavior on the one end of its domain, on the left end. And then it goes to positive infinity as x goes to positive infinity. So as you go out to the right on the green graph, it doesn't really look like it's going to infinity, but it does. It just does it super slow. Like, it always keeps... How that green graph will reach any height you want it to reach eventually. It'll just take a doggone long time to do it. So those are some, you know, an a, another few of these sort of atomic level facts that we use to evaluate limits. And 
when you get to thinking about limits at plus or minus infinity for trigonometric functions, none of them exist. They all do not exist because all trig functions wobble. They do this thing called oscillation. Like for example there, you see the graph of the sine function and forever and ever it just keeps doing that same sort of periodic wave, right? And so it never, as x goes to infinity or negative infinity, it never settles in on any kind of like particular value that it's getting close to. It also doesn't like blow up and go to infinity or negative infinity on the y values. It just keeps bouncing up and down between negative one and positive one. So all you can say about trigonometric functions limits at infinity are that they don't exist due to oscillation. So here's a little problem or two that involves those kinds of functions. Um, you can use some of the same tricks that we were using for the rational functions, like by dividing through by um, like on this one, it occurs to me like, why don't I try to multiply by one over e to the x, top and bottom, see what happens. If I do that, then th that function looks like this. 3 plus 10 over e to the x over 1. And 1 over e to the x can be written as e to the negative x. So this is really 3 plus 10 to times e to the negative x just over 1. So I can just drop the 1. So now if I want to take the limit, as say x goes to positive infinity of the original function, it's the same as taking the limit as x goes to infinity of 3 plus 10 e to the negative x. And we just learned on the previous slide here that e to the negative x, the blue one, as x goes to negative infinity, so the blue one on the right, goes to positive infinity. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Our x is going to positive infinity, so we're looking at the limit, the blue limit on the left. So it goes to zero. So just according to what we learned a second ago, this e to this term right here is going to zero. And so you get something going to three plus 10 times zero, it's coming out to three. We can also look at the limit going to negative infinity. But this time, e to the negative x as x goes to negative infinity kind of makes that exponent a big positive exponent, and so you end up getting a positive infinity there. So you get like 3 plus 10 times something that's going to infinity. It's going to go to infinity. Because that term right there is going to infinity. And multiplying it by 10 just makes it even bigger, and adding 3 to it just makes it a little bit bigger, too. Um, now this one, intuitively, I know it's going to go to 0. And here's why. Because the sine function just bounces up and down between negative 1 and positive 1, whereas the natural log function, if I'm letting x go to positive infinity, um, the natural log function goes to positive infinity also. But what I could do to make that a bit more official is to use the squeeze law. So I know that the sine function always stays between negative 1 and positive one. And I also know that natural log of x is bigger than zero whenever x is bigger than one. Now, our x is going to positive infinity, so I'm, I can assume, safely assume that my x is larger than one. So I could divide through this whole thing by natural log and I'd be dividing by something positive, so it won't change the direction of these inequalities. And now, just a minute ago, we said, hey, as x goes to infinity, the natural log goes to infinity. 
But if something's going to infinity and then you reciprocate it, it's going to go to zero. So this term right here is going to zero. Similarly, this term is going to zero. So that forces the stuff that's in the middle to go to zero also. So the answer to the question was zero using the squeeze law. Okay, I think I'm probably going to stop there. Yeah. So I realized there was a lot of material in this section too. These, this section and the previous section, we really covered a lot of ground. But I think at this point you have all the information you need to calculate just about any limit that someone would put in front of you. Of course, I'm sure that we can find counterexamples to that, but um, you know, your standard run-of-the-mill limits, I think you're well prepared. So at this point, you just need to do a lot of practice. Practice as many of these things as you can get your hands on. Okay. Talk to you again soon.